Good morning. You are with the House Government Operations Committee. Uh, we are uh, gathered in committee this morning to uh, to take our first round of um, sort of reactions from folks uh, around the governance change proposal that we put on the table yesterday. Um, just to remind folks about the process that we're going to undertake, we're going to we're going to hear uh, from from a, a, a variety of folks about the governance proposals during committee today this morning. Um, then tomorrow we will have an opportunity to get into committee and hear uh, some first reactions and responses to the plan design changes that were put on the table. Uh, tomorrow night we have our first of two public hearings, uh, which I understand are, um, are very well subscribed. In fact, they may be full. So uh, thank you to the unions for um, getting the message out there to folks to, to come and join those meetings. Um, we are in the process of trying to figure out how to fit more, uh, more voices into those public hearings uh, since we're oversubscribed at this point. And um, uh, so we may, uh, we may try to extend the time of the public hearings and or um, ask people to stick to two minutes instead of three in the, uh, in the hopes that we can hear from more people. So committee, that is a decision point that we need to make and would welcome you to weigh in on it. Um, hopefully we'll have a few minutes of committee discussion before we go to um, judicial retention later this morning. Um, we have one participant who is on a cell phone and we would love to rename you. So if you can tell us who you are, we'll get you renamed. So um, this is Patricia Gable on the phone, court administrator. That, thank you so much. That was my guess because you were the one person who, who we had invited to be here this morning whose name didn't yet appear. So we have you renamed and now, uh, now everyone can see your name on your Zoom box. So thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you. Um, so folks, uh, you know, I think it's helpful to just reorient ourselves to why we're having a conversation about governance to begin with. Um, there has been a lot of uh, conversation and I think universal recognition that, um, that the financial health of our um, pension system is rocky and uh, and we have to ask ourselves in the context of, um, of putting our pensions on a better path, whether there are changes that we could make to the governance um, of the pension board um, and uh, governance over uh, uh, the investment of our, your pension dollars. Um, and it makes sense to have this conversation now. And uh, I also recognize that there are many other people who have different, uh, different ideas or different, um, uh, different understandings of the dynamics within our pension governance. And we are more than happy to hear uh, um, a new set of ideas if anyone has uh, a different governance model that they think uh, would work better than the proposal that we've put on the table. Uh, so we do want to spend our time uh, hearing from folks about this and, and hearing where, where we have alignment and where we might differ. Um, so thank you for being here this morning. Um, I think I'm just going to run through the list uh, relatively quickly, um, ask folks to share their thoughts um, and leave some time for committee questions. So uh, Steve Howard, thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. Um, I want to just do a, a quick uh, disclaimer. Um, I'm having a bit of construction work done at my house, and my 400-pound dog is sitting here in my home office, and I hope she's going to not go nuts <laughs> in the middle of my testimony. So if you do hear her go a little crazy, I'll try to mute as fast as I can, uh, and hopefully she won't hurt me in the process. Um, so uh, I will, uh, I'll will. i just start uh, with my testimony and, and hope for the best. <laughs> um, for the record, I'm Steve Howard. I'm the executive director of the Vermont State Employees Association. And um, I will start by saying that um, this is about the, the governance structure. So I won't go into really any um, conversation about um, the benefit uh, proposal. I understand we'll be testifying 
on that tomorrow. Um, and I just say that because I know there are a number of state employees listening and they may want, want, to, want to know why I'm not talking about that since that is a, a very uh, hot topic that they will of course expect their union staff to address. Um, so I just want to start uh, also just in light of the, the very um, the quick conversations we've been able to have with our members since you, the proposal was made yesterday. Our members, um, you know, really believe that this process needs to be slowed down. Um, having a day to review this isn't really enough. Um, and one concern that our members do have about the governance proposal is it really hasn't been a thoughtful study done by an independent entity that would provide some feedback about whether this is in fact the structure that we need. And I understand that there has been some move um, uh, by um, the treasurer's office and by the boards to um, look into having a study done and our members would support having that study um, rather than making a, a quick decision without thoughtful analysis uh, from an expert or for somebody who uh, can be more independent from the process. Um, I wanna start where we can agree um, we do believe it's important to maintain representation and participation of members uh, in the system. Um, and that's an important uh, objective that we want to maintain. I think um, we can agree that there um, can, should be and can be more um, uh, frequent and, um, and uh, more frequent experience studies that that would be helpful uh, to the system. Uh, and that the more disclosure of the the fees uh, that are, are associated with the, with the system, more uh, transparency is really important to our members. We can, we can support that. Um, our members are not sure that New Hampshire is the model <laughs> um, ever on anything, <laughs> but particularly uh, in, in this case, uh, you know, their pension system is not one of the better funded pension systems in the country. Uh, we're not sure that that really um, is the model we should be uh, basing our decisions on here in Vermont. Um, we also think that this is another reason why we've called for a summer study committee uh, because our members right now, uh, quite frankly, are very busy. They're in the middle of managing a pandemic um, and they haven't really had the chance to pay a lot of attention to this issue because they're trying to save Vermonters' lives. Um, and so you know, we believe a summer study committee that would look at all the, the retirement systems across the country, particularly the, the states where they are meeting their investment returns, um, and investigate what they're doing differently, but also investigate our investment strategy um, and looking at what's going on uh, with our investment strategy and some of the decisions there. An independent investigation of our investment strategy um, would be really helpful over the summer and into the fall in a process that our members can believe in. Um, and have confidence in. Um, right now, I would say it's fair, it would be a fair assessment that our members do not have confidence in the system and the, in the, the process that we're following now here in Vermont. Um, a couple of just quick observations. Um, we uh, note that in the proposal that was, um, that was made yesterday, um, the treasurer um, is made the chair of the, um, of the new uh, commission uh, but not given a vote. And while we disagree strongly with the treasurer's recommendation, uh, we do respect that she, she and, and folks who are elected statewide by Vermonters uh, tend to be um, financial experts, folks with a financial background and, and who have the backing of the people of Vermont. And we, we aren't sure why um, that position wouldn't have a vote. Um, and we're, um, that seems to be a, a, a concern that we should look at. Um, the other observation that we made is uh, in just a short time that we've had to look at it, and this really, to be honest with you, we haven't had a time to fully vet this. Uh, it's going to take a week or two before we can get our members' attention, uh, really talk with them about what the proposal is, and give them enough time to, to think about it in a responsible way. But I'm just doing some initial um, feedback that was provided um, just really quickly. It does appear that the new uh, the new proposed um, board uh, or commission uh, is heavily weighted towards management. Um, if you look at the uh, current the current makeup um, of uh, VPIC and you compare it to the board, we notice that in your proposal there would be six appointments by the governor. And you know, for the state employees, the governor is the management for most from in most cases, um, and uh, that 
those appointments, um, that would this this proposal would give him six appointments. The legislature would have two appointments. Um, and with all due respect to the legislature, our members view the legislature as part of the management. Um, and so this would provide eight out of 15 people who are directly the managers of uh, in-state government. Um, and that really dissipates the voice of the workers. Um, and so we, we are concerned about that, particularly when you add that the, that the three employer representatives are now going to be on here and not just chosen by the by the various boards of the systems, um, of the of the pension systems, uh, pension funds, um, but now three employer representatives are going to be added, and so then you have eleven out of fifteen people who are likely to be managers or or come with a management perspective, um, and that you know raises some concerns. We've had some very bad experiences um, recently with the Vermont Labor Relations Board. Um, and uh, choices that the governor has made <laughs> um, uh, to fill various slots that are supposed to be, um, you know, uh, meant for a particular category. But in this case, 11 out of 15 positions would likely be either directly managers of our members or would have a philosophy that is similar to what a manager um, would have. And that's not all bad, but it's just uh, one that concerns us. It's not a, as a balanced or a, uh, a, an approach that uh, we would prefer. Um, we also think that um, the proposal may go too far in disempowering the boards, um, particularly around uh, taking the process that where VPIC and the, the relevant board make the decision about the rate of return to now uh, relegating the board uh, to an advisory role. <laughs> we don't think that that um, we don't, we're not sure that that's the best uh, approach to a collaborative, uh, thoughtful uh, investment strategy. Um, and so uh, we are uh, concerned about that, um, that approach that, that is outlined in the, the new proposal. And then finally, I would just say that um, we uh, currently elect our members to the retirement system. We do it um, at our annual meeting. Uh, the treasurer doesn't play a role in that. Um, we're not sure what role the treasurer or the treasurer's office would now play or if that's practical at all. Uh, from our perspective, we think we've elected uh, some of the best and the brightest of the state employees with a great deal of financial and um, actuarial and uh, uh, ex a lot of ex professional experience as members um, fiduciary members of, of, of pension systems, whether it's the state pension system or uh, a municipal pension system. Uh, we, we take the election process of who we send uh, to represent us in, uh, on these boards very seriously. And that's why our members have had such extensive backgrounds in either a, le a legal background, finance background, um, or I've had extensive experience, um, you know, serving on um, on retirement boards in the past. It's retirement is very is a subject that that state employees pay a lot of attention to, as you might have noticed, <laughs> and we take uh, this very seriously. So we're not sure we need the the treasurer to oversee the election of our members. We think we're doing just fine the way it is, um, and uh, we're not sure it's really practical. Um, so those are just our quick observations with less, you know, really less than 24 hours uh, trying to get the attention of folks who are managing a pandemic um, and who don't have as much time um, as they might have if we weren't in the middle of a pandemic, um, which is partly why we find uh, this process concerning and why we would urge this committee um, to invest as much as you can in the pension system, but put the questions, the big questions about the governance structure and the benefits um, into a summer study committee. Give our, our members a chance to take a breath from this pandemic, from this emergency, and be able to, uh, to uh, focus on the discussion around pensions more fully um, when they're not distracted by trying to save Vermonters' lives. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Steve, and, and a big um, thanks and appreciation to all of our hardworking um, state employees. I know that uh, this has been a challenging year, um, and we certainly appreciate the, uh, the over and above the call of duty that we've seen from so many people. Um, 
committee members, questions for Steve. Mike McCarthy. Hey, Steve, thanks for being with us. And, um, and I do also want to echo the chair's comments that, you know, I know that these conversations are really challenging and that there's a lot of anxiety around some of the work that we're trying to do here among state employees and, and, um, and teachers. And so we take that really seriously. And I, I also, you know, in light of trying to be really fair and dig in and do some work, I want to unpack some of the things that we have been hearing and ask how your members, you know, over time have responded to, you know, the fact that we have missed the assumptions again and again around both rate of return and the experience assumptions. And, you know, if you have thoughts about how, you know, we can balance the political decision making and the, the expertise that we're trying to, to bring in with this initial proposal. So, you know, I, I think um, one thing that really would be helpful is uh, more frequent experience studies. Um, and, and that we think um, would bring the legislature, uh, bring the, the issue uh, to the attention of the legislature and the governor um, more regularly. We're in this position now, and we have a 30-year plan to pay off pensions, and we are well into that plan. Uh, we are turning the corner on our mortgage um, to uh, the point where we're now starting to pay more than just interest. Um, and so we think that uh, has been going well. We're here today because of the um, the experience study and the fact that it was an experience study over a five-year period. So perhaps one that um, like the one, the recommendation you make in, in the presentation, in the uh, proposal that was made yesterday, where it's more likely to be three years. We think that would be very helpful. Um, that, that is, uh, that, uh, I don't think we are 100% convinced that we have to reinvent the whole um, mechanism that we have now um, and certainly weight it down with more managers. Um, we don't necessarily think more managers means better outcomes. Um, but we do want to make sure that we maximize uh, the folks whose retirement is dependent on the, the successful um, return um, of investment. And we're doing pretty, you know, we are, people should know, you know, there is uh, a 62 cents on every dollar that we make in the pension system comes from our return on investment. Um, and that's why the pensions are such a great uh, economic development driver in Vermont. Um, so we, we should be fair that it's not, you know, the, the world is not crashing down around us. Uh, we can take our time to be deliberative and thoughtful um, about how we make changes. We're not saying we shouldn't make changes, but we're saying we should, the process really does matter. John Gannon. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Steve, for testifying this morning. Um, we appreciate your comments. Um, following up on Rep McCarthy's questions um, about the missed assumptions, both the investment assumptions as well as the other demographic assumptions, um, did anybody raise to you um, concerns about the investment performance um, of, of the, the state employees pension plan over time? Um, were there concerns raised? I think we have always been concerned about the unfunded liability um, and um, uh, concerned that uh, that it might grow. And there's always been a sort of a discussion about um, how things might um, how things might go off the rails. But we are pretty confident in the uh, plan that the treasurer put together um, in I believe it was in 2010. Um, we are grateful and uh, supportive of the fact that the legislature and the governor of two different parties have um, made the, uh, the amortization payments, the mortgage payments, um, to uh, resolve that and that we're well on our way to do that. Um, so, you know, it, it's, there have been, of course, uh, conversations about the, the investment, um, the rate of return, and whether that's the right return, right rate of return um, for a long time. Um, you, you, it would, it would be hard to argue that that hasn't been in the, even just in the public sphere, something everybody's been talking about. Um, and so that's been addressed. I mean, the rate of return has been lowered from seven, uh, five to seven. 
uh, which some people think may be more realistic. Um, the actuary actually made a recommendation of a range of seven to seven point one five. Um, many people believe 7.15 is, is more accurate. Uh, so I, I think to answer your question, there has been you know, just general conversation about um, all of the factors surrounding uh, whether we're gonna make it to 2038 um, when we pay off this unfunded liability. But do you realize that you know, our, our missed assumptions have added over 600 million, almost $700 million to our unfunded liability? Right, so I think I think it's really important that we have realistic investment assumptions, and so the change that was made um, and agreed to by the retirement uh, boards, uh, we think um, while the range may not be something we're 100 percent sold on, uh, we thought you know the uh, that maybe we we could be something closer to 7.15. Um, we think that was um, a, a realistic adjustment that would address uh, the concern that you raise. We certainly have a concern um, when we don't meet our investment returns, um, just as I think all of us agree on that. Um, uh, but we believe that that has been um, addressed and certainly could be in the future um, prevented by having more frequent uh, experience studies. So just one follow-up question. Did your BPIC representatives raise concerns over the past decade about the investment performance with the VSEA board? I mean, was this something that was highlighted? Um, because I mean, until very recently, the performance of the Vermont pensions has been horrendous. It, it's been in the bottom quartile of public pensions. Um, uh, you know, and, and as I said, it's added a lot of unfunded liability to our pension system. Yeah, so, uh, you know, there's always been discussions. Uh, I, don't, I don't recall if we had a specific discussion with members of VPIC. I think they have been a uh, part of um, the ongoing discussion about the health of the, of the fund. Um, I think what's, you know, what's really important is uh, what's going, what's happening now um, and what we do now um, and to address these concerns. And, and so I think that's what I, I, I was trying to focus my um, comments on both on the shift of power towards management in this proposal from our members perspective, um, but also um, uh, just a concern about the process. And, and I know people say, well, if you're talking about the process, it's because you're losing on the substance. I don't agree with that. I think it's really important um, that we uh, think about whether or not um, uh, our state employees believe uh, that they have been consulted in their part of the collaborative decision-making in, in terms of improving the system. We all agree that there's a problem. Um, we all agree that we need to make changes, um, but I think um, how we go about making those decisions is vital so that people have confidence in um, both uh, the process that made those decisions and the decisions that are made. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Hal Colston. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Steve, for your testimony and your perspective on this issue. Um, equity is very important to this committee. So what does equity look like through the eyes of your members to address the challenges of our pension system? Very important question. <laughs> uh, and I would be honest with you, um, I don't know that we've had a, a had the opportunity or have, had, have spent the time to have a, a, a serious conversation about that. Um, um, I do think as we think about this proposal and, and we focus on the governance of the, of the system, um, we believe that um, we have to um, magnify the voice of uh, the folks who are uh, the, of our members of the state employees um, and the teachers who are on the front lines and um, who are doing the work and hoping in anticipation of a retirement in, with dignity. Um, we don't wanna overload these board, this, this board or these, the process for making these decisions um, with folks who are uh, handpicked by the governor um, and who are likely to have philosophies that may or may not align with ours. Um, so we wanna make sure that uh, the system we set up isn't, um, in fact, increasing politics in, in injecting more politics into the 
into the uh, decision making about the rates of returns and the other um, governance issues around the pension. Thank you. All right, thank you, Steve. Um, Tanya Vihovsky. Um, looking at some of the changes to this pension, I wonder, Steve, what you anticipate, and obviously I recognize your crystal ball is probably broken today, but I wonder how this might impact workforce recruitment and retention. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, that is a, a million dollar question. I, I think it's fair to say um, we have some serious problems on our hands right now. Um, we are that affect public safety. Uh, we hear from our lieutenants in the state police about how desperate they are with 30 vacancies. We hear about um, the massive overtime in our corrections facilities, people working 16 hour shifts and sleeping in their cars. We spend millions of dollars on traveling nurses because we don't have enough nurses for our facilities. We are down something close to 50 uh, CDL um, drivers who plow the roads and do the maintenance. That's with the retirement system we have now. Um, and our biggest concern representative is that most seasoned and experienced state employees are busily filling out their retirement paperwork right now uh, because they have no trust in this process. They don't believe the legislature will um, protect them and they um, are just gonna retire. That is a massive loss of, of institutional knowledge and history that will lead to poorer service uh, for your constituents. Um, the pension system is a benefit to all Vermonters. It's not just for the state employees and the teachers. It attracts the best and the brightest. It keeps them there longer. Um, and as I said before, it's probably the state's most effective economic development program. Can I just ask a quick follow-up? Sure. Um, where does this put us in terms of the state surrounding us? I know when we talk about a lot of policy changes, whether it's raising the minimum wage or all the other things that we talk about, we often look to, you know, will this drive people to New Hampshire or mm -hmm. New York or, or our border states? And I wonder if you have any knowledge as to sort of where that would place us with the states around us. Sure. So I haven't done an, a thorough analysis of that, and we are we are looking at that. I do understand anecdotally that, for instance, the retirement system in New York is more generous than the one we have in Vermont. But I am familiar with New Hampshire, as long as we're making comparisons to New Hampshire. Um, I'll never agree that their maple syrup is better than ours, but uh, we could have that fight. Uh, but I will say that if you're a correctional officer um, working in Vermont, um, you make you start three dollars an hour less than you would if you worked in New Hampshire. And in New Hampshire, um, if you work 25 years and hit age 55, you are able to retire with full retirement. Uh, in Vermont, um, that is not true. And, and under the proposal, and then we're not talking about benefits, but under the proposal I saw yesterday, you know, we could have correctional officers. Uh, trying to do use of force at age 66, um, which, uh, you know, I'm about to turn 50 this year and I can barely function <laughs> compared to what I was able to do when I was 18 or 20. I can't imagine if I had to meet the physical demands of our correctional officers at age 66. Um, I think they'll always do their best, um, but th that's a very physically demanding job. And if they were in New Hampshire, they would have not only better pay, uh, but they would have more generous retirement benefits. Do you have any understanding of what their governance model looks like and how they're, how they're and maybe you don't, because I, I know you've only been sitting with this for a very short period of time. Yeah, I, I don't. Um, I understand the treasurer is testifying uh, later, and I know she's had uh, some time, more time than I have, uh, to look at how they uh, structure their system. Um, I understand just from the document that was handed out yesterday that that this is the um, the uh, model that uh, is is being looked at, and and I know I heard Representative Hooper, um, I can't remember which one he is, Hooper number one, Hooper number two, <laughs> which number he is, he's Hooper number three. <laughs> uh, he also I think echoed one of our members' concerns, which is that you know their pension, the, the position of their pension, uh, and their unfunded liability is not great, um, and so why would we look at that model? I think it begs the question for a much more comprehensive uh, look over the summer and fall at you know all, all of the models, particularly the states that are doing the best in terms of funding their pension system. Mike McCarthy. 
So I want to bring things back around to the comments we had about how important it is for there to be confidence in the pension being there. You know, we and uh, Representative Vyhovsky had mentioned, you know, the the you know uh, some of the concern about you know what happens if there are changes made, and I think we're all really concerned about what happens if there isn't confidence in the future performance of the funds and how those are managed and governed. And I'm wondering, Steve. You know, if you, in, in light of some of the comments we heard last week, where when we ask questions about the rate of return assumptions uh, being missed or the assumptions, the demographic assumptions being missed from some of the members of the various boards, um, we, got, we got answers to the effect of, you know, things are kind of, it's very complicated and we take lots of things into account, but the history says that the current governance structure has missed over and over and over again. And I'm wonder, wondering if that missing the mark has, and the fact that when it has a negative impact on that mortgage payment, you know, the ADEC uh, going, you know, spiking on all Vermonters uh, in, sort of unexpectedly when we get bad news. Um, if your members want to see better performance, if they want to see the, the numbers be realistic, um, one of the comments that was made last week that really struck me was that the rate of return assumption should be uh, decided in light of past decision making on policy. And I don't know what that has to do with the fund performance uh, and, and what the expected rate of return in the future is. Uh, and that, that really took me by surprise and told me that we needed to make some changes in governance. And uh, so I want to know, you know if there's a, a lack of confidence among VSEA members about the governance and how accurate or how clear-eyed those votes that they're taking around rate of return and, and demographic assumptions are? So I think that's a very good question. I'd say one thing I think we have to also calculate into this um, is regardless of the governance structure, um, you know, we had a 22% loss in, our, in the value of our fund. Um, as a result of too big to fail and uh, the policies on the federal level that led to the crash of our economy. And I think that has meant that our um, fiduciaries have been extremely cautious in their investment strategies, um, maybe le less, uh, more so than other states that have had better returns. Um, so we have had members question that, are we being too cautious um, uh, in terms of uh, the amount of risk we're willing to assume? Um, and, I, and that doesn't really, I think the governance structure doesn't have a whole lot of um, concern about that. I think they have um, made a significant a number of changes uh, to the investment advisors, for instance, they have a new chair of the VPIC board. Um, and we are, you know, I think, I think he testified before your committee, um, you know, our, our more recent numbers on, on rate of return are closer to 15% and they'll smooth out maybe at some point. Um, but it is important that we meet our expectations. And, and I think that's why our members want to take a long view of this and not try to jam something through um, in the middle of a pandemic at the tail end of a legislative session um, without having had the chance to really contemplate um, all of the factors that go into deciding or to, to determining what the rate of return is. Um, we know that, you know, the president can say something crazy and the stock market goes up and down, um, you know, a lot of factors that are out of control, out of the control of um, any board and any, any structure have had an impact on our investment returns. And, and so we need to look at um, how, uh, how we can insulate ourselves from that without being too, too cautious that we don't get the kind of investment returns that we, we need. But I think it's fairly uh, easy to say that um, our members would like us to meet our investment returns. Uh, we think this change in the, the assumption, while maybe a little bit too harsh um, from our perspective is a, a step in that direction. <clears throat> All right, so folks, we've got uh, we've got four other perspectives um, that we need to hear from uh, with respect to the governance proposal that we have um, put on the table here. And so, what I'd like to do now is ask uh, Peter if you wouldn't mind holding that question, and if we have time at the end, we'll come back to you. 
Um, <clears throat> Jeff Fannin is here with the Teachers Association. And um, before you start, Jeff, um, I just want to say through you and to your members, if, if anyone's watching, um, I understand how hard this year has been for our classroom teachers, uh, for our education professionals who who had to stand everything on top of its head uh, a little over a year ago now and continue to meet the needs of our kids who are increasingly in crisis because of the, uh, the economic um, and social isolation challenges of this global pandemic. And so I, I know that this entire conversation and the, and the premise of this conversation is really hard for your membership. Um, and I know that it's hard for them to engage in the details of this because they are really just meeting the day-to-day -day needs of their students. Um, and in many cases in very difficult working conditions for themselves. So please thank them for me um, and please, uh, please do engage with us um, in this conversation about government go governance um, and in the future conversations. So I uh, would love to hear your uh, responses to the questions of whether we need to make governance changes to help our pensions get on a path to sustainability. Well, well thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, committee, and, and thank you, Madam Chair, for the, the comments. Teachers are, uh, and all educators are, uh, as you pointed out, you know, turn, turn on their heads to Keep, school, keep schools operating back in the spring. They're open largely now, almost all of them, uh, and kids are in school, uh, maybe very various models and they're juggling it all remotely in person. And uh, we've heard rumors of, you know, possibly uh, changing again in a month or less than a month. Um, so they continue to uh, respond to the needs of students and the communities and, and, and they're uh, uh, at the ready and this is a tough conversation and a particular tough moment for them. And, you know, one of the questions, and I'll just start there um, by saying they are, um, you know, asking us, why us, why now? And that's a fundamental question that they, they don't have an answer for. So I think that's what we're, we're endeavoring to have that conversation. So with that said, my name is Jeff Fan. I'm the executive director of Vermont and EA. Uh, and I'm here to speak with you today about the proposed pension governance changes document uh, that was released yesterday. Uh, the question I have left after reading the document is, um, what is it the problem that we are trying to solve with these proposed governance changes? And what did the several boards play? What part did the several boards play in the fiscal challenges? So um, some may say that because of the draconian nature of the plan design proposal that we may discuss tomorrow, uh, <clears throat> that these governance proposals are small potatoes not worthy of addressing or arguing about. I do, however, believe that the board and board composition matters today as well as tomorrow, and examining the instant proposal is worthy of conversation, thorough conversation. Uh, the current retirement boards did not cause the current problems that have been identified to me, at least, since we started meeting with the treasurer in November. The problems were fiscal in nature, specifically the ADEC, the, uh, the annual contribution, if you will, and the unfunded liabilities uh, increased significantly last year. The boards did not cause these problems. And instead, we need to ask why did these numbers, these two numbers increase so much in one year? Uh, and I believe there are three reasons why these increase uh, and they are well known, I think. We talked, you talked about them with Steve Howard just a few minutes ago. In the case of the teacher retirement system, Visters, uh, the state for many years un underfunded the plan. This is well documented and totals of hundreds, of hundreds of millions of dollars. And indeed in the late 1990s, a teacher member of the Visters board, Jay Kaplan, went so far as to file a lawsuit against the state for this underfunding. And the settlement of that lawsuit led to the passage <clears throat> of a law requiring the governor to identify when the administration's proposed budget does not include full funding of the plan. In other words, it was a teacher member of the board who raised the alarms and nobody else. Uh, removing, therefore, the voice of members uh, most directly affected by the state's decision is alarming and not supported by this past practice. Uh, the actuarial assumptions were not accurate. That's the other one, another reason. The board hired outside actuaries so-called experts to make recommendations and advise the board about the plan's demographics and therefore plan decisions 
that would be then based upon these recommendations. We learned last year that the actuary's assumptions and recommendations were not accurate. <clears throat> but the board did not make the recommendations, i.e. the board composition is not to blame. These inaccurate assumptions cause sizable financial increases. We are trying to react to now, but the board does not need correction. It is the actuaries who we should be examining. The rate of return, the other big issue that Representative Gannon pointed out, uh, was lowered in November last year, and that added significantly to the fiscal issues. Again, the board hired outside Wall Street experts and advisors who made the recommendations upon which the board relied. The board operated as it should have, <clears throat> and the law requires. It did its due diligence, but it turns out the Wall Street experts were not, so, were not too expert in their rate of return recommendation, and now the board lowered the rate of return to make up for the earlier prediction. Again, the board did not cause the problem, and fixing the board does, not, does nothing to examine and address the underlying problem. The composition of the board is perfectly in line with the recommendation of the Boston College Center for Retirement Research. That center examined board composition, public pension board composition, and suggested a board that is largely as we have it now. And we should not attempt to fix a problem that frankly isn't a problem. The BC Research Group recommends a board of between six and 10 members. We have six <clears throat> and the proposal um, calls for 15 members, which far exceeds uh, the academic research. Moreover, the proposal overly uses political appointees, which the BC uh, report specifically recommends against, and the proposal does so by, a limit, or by lim limiting and reducing stakeholder voice. And that, again, contradicts the research recommended, recommending sufficient stakeholder representation on retirement boards. I think we have the, the right mix right now. Certainly the BC Center recommends at least two board members with financial and actuarial experience, and that change is worthy of discussion. Making wholesale changes, however, as the proposal does, is not advisable and should be avoided, especially since the current board did not cause the problems before us. Um, perhaps we should examine Taft-Hartley plans. These are plans <clears throat> that like our plans are jointly administered between employee and employers, and to turn, we should look to see how they uh, are doing overall. Uh, and like Steve, limiting the role of new board, and like Steve mentioned, I'm sorry, limiting the role of this new board, as you've done with the proposal, to strictly advisory as uh, is complicated and may uh, put too much power in the small group of people, which is again, not advisable and recommended by the BC um, report. Um, a couple of thoughts, and, and I'll address some of the questions that were raised earlier, if you will, Madam Chair, <clears throat> to, to speed up the process. Um, and if I miss some, I apologize. <clears throat> I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, I agree with Steve, and I think that the proposal uh, that we'll discuss tomorrow, I guess, for more frequent experience studies. Simply put, it makes sense. Um, but this discussion today is about governance. Um, Representative Gannon, you, you, you spoke about uh, investment rate of returns. Yes, I did raise the concern and, and uh, just quickly stated the member teacher members of the board don't report to Vermont NEA. They're fiduciaries to that board. Um, but I did raise the issue of rate of return some years ago uh, with the treasurer. And <clears throat> it is concerning to me, uh, as it was then, that you know, we, we, we don't have it right. What I suggested then and, and suggested, you know, more recently is that we step it down and not do it as, as such a large measure as we did in November that caused the financial issues that we're facing. So if we had stepped it down over time, I think we could have managed this better. Um, so I think that's that's one thought uh, to, to respond to your question earlier. Um, and the, the investment. Uh, investment advice was just in hindsight was not great. I mean, that's simply put, and that's, that's unfortunate. Uh, Representative Colston, you, you, uh, you talked about what equity looks like <clears throat> yesterday. I had a, it was yesterday. Maybe it was Monday. I, <laughs> the days are all merged together in this zoom world. I spoke with the treasurer and she mentioned to me that women boards, excuse me, boards that are comprised of larger number of women on them 
do better than, than other boards. That would look like equity to me, for example. 77% of my teacher members are women, and perhaps they should have a larger voice in how this plan is operated and managed. <clears throat> um, and Representative Vahovsky, you mentioned recruitment and retention. Uh, I too am concerned about that. Uh, and I suggest perhaps speaking with some superintendents along the borders, uh, communities and school districts. For example, Jim Kalkeen is a superintendent down in Bennington. For years, he has said that he serves as a, a training ground for New York. So new teachers arrive in Bennington and ha have done this for years and, uh, um, and then go to New York where they have better pay and better pension. So you know, it, if we're going to exacerbate that problem, that's of concern to me and it should be to concern to all of us. Um, so I, I do have concerns there. <clears throat> And uh, Representative McCarthy, you talked about confidence in the system by doing nothing. I agree. Uh, there is concern about that. And several years ago, I raised the issue of investments with the treasurer and why it is we're paying millions of dollars to Wall Street experts when there's a really good example right staring us in the face. At the time, Warren Buffett, who we know is a, a pretty savvy investor himself, has done quite well, I think, uh, far better than I could ever imagine. Um, <clears throat> had a bet with five hedge fund managers. It was known in the community as the bet. And he said he could outperform them, all of them, by simply putting a sizable amount of money, I don't wanna say a million dollars, but uh, some amount of money that was not insignificant into an index fund. And it was a 10 year bet to see who could do better with that investment. And it was a bet that I think, I believe the, uh, the proceeds uh, from the bet would go to some charity of the choosing of the winner. And Mr. Buffett clobbered the hedge fund managers, absolutely crushed them in the investment simply by putting his money into an, an index fund. So the, the well-managed, well-heeled, well-compensated hedge fund managers lost a sizable bet to Warren Buffett simply who put his money into an index fund. I think we can do better than simply just sending our money to Wall Street and then when they get it wrong, they ask us for more money. I mean, that's essentially what's happening here. Um, and I think we ought to look at that, that underlying assumptions that, are, that we're all looking at, that Wall Street is the, uh, the experts that we should follow at all, all, uh, all turns and paths. Uh, they are not always right. There are other ways to do this, and I think we ought to explore those. And that would, that would come up about with the, the composition of the board. And I don't think it's the board composition that caused this problem, and I think we should go tenderly into that conversation about making wholesale changes as the proposal does without really understanding the ramifications of them. So with that, I'm happy to answer other questions and I, I tried to answer everybody's questions. I may have missed one or two and I apologize. I appreciate you uh, doing that. That's um, good efficiency here. Um, so there was a couple things that you said that I wanted to come back to because um, you, you pointed to three three dynamics, three, uh, three contributions to the position that we're in right now. Um, I think we can all agree that um, historic underfunding is a big part of why we're in uh, this uncomfortable state. Um, uh, the legislature and the governor have since um, been making faithfully the ADEC payments. Um, and I think the reason why we're, we're here um, doing another analysis of this is that the ADEC payments are not predictable, nor are they sustainable. Um, which, uh, you know, the contribution to that is, uh, is solely based on the performance of, uh, of the, the retirement systems. Um, so you pointed also to actuaries making bad predictions um, and to our rate of return and, and referencing, you know, uh, experts who, who may not have, um, have advised uh, with, the, with the right combination of investments in order to, uh, to help us get better returns in our pension system. Um, but I wanted to push back just a little bit on the notion that we are taking away stakeholder voice in this proposed governance change, um, because I think that in order for folks who are sitting in the position of power in, uh, in our retirement system to be able to identify actuaries who may have made uh, mistaken assumptions or 
push back against uh, the outside experts um, who, who may not be making the right investment recommendations. We need to have um, stakeholders who have that set of experience, uh, who have that set of skills to be able to dissect what they're hearing from, uh, from the financial advisors and dissect what they're hearing from the actuaries. And that's why the governance proposal that we've made has each of the uh, system boards recommending their own uh, person with uh, financial expertise. And, and that is really intended to say, you know, you as a, uh, as a teacher's system board have your expert sitting at the table, looking at the recommendations, looking at the analysis and able to make a, a uh, perhaps a, a more uh, educated assessment of um, of whether the recommendations are um, are correct, and so we uh, we certainly look at this as an opportunity to beef up the expertise as well as to uh, to give each of the retirement systems the ability to place their own expert at the table. Uh, Bob Hooper has his hand up, and then we're going to switch gears to another part of the conversation. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. My hand has gone up and down as people have asked questions that I want to put it down now before I forget. Thank you, Mr. Merwicki. Um, so, Jeff, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, and then I, I was holding off so that I could ask one question to all three employee representatives and have them answer. But your conversation just now with the chair brings a point to mind. Did the actuaries make recommendations that were in error or did our experience with our actual employee groups deviate from what the actuarial tables and the actuarial groupings predicted would be happening? And that's a fine point because a lot of this weight is being thrown on actuaries doing the wrong thing when, quite frankly, if we look at your teacher's group experience, it is heavily weighted because people retired more so, more frequently earlier than was predicted. Question number one. Uh, question number two, uh, we're hearing this a lot. It's beginning to sound a little bit like an echo chamber where if you repeat it enough, it'll become true. Uh, in your experience, Steve, Mike, uh, have you any experience where you have evidence or even just heard a rumor that a political decision was made by VPIC that was not based upon a fiduciary responsibility? And the last question is, you mentioned uh, Jay and uh, filing the lawsuit. Quite frankly, I was there when we threw Bill, S Bill Sorrell out of his office as Secretary of Administration after arguing with him about this for an hour. Um, I think that under proposed governance, Jay would not be allowed to be sitting in that position as an advisor. Do you consider him in your experience to have been an expert in this type of uh, dealings? Uh, well, uh, first off, Jay's no longer with us. And so I, I miss Jay because he, I, I don't know, I don't know what, what's defined as an expert, but I will tell you that Jay was a learned man, studied the, the, uh, the pension systems for years and years was very focused on it. Was a great advisor to his his uh, I would say his younger colleagues, advising them on on certain financial matters. So I think he was extremely learned, uh, and I would call him an expert. I don't know that he would qualify in, under in a court of law as an expert on this, but certainly Jay was uh, on the board for a good long time as an active, and then as a retired teacher, uh, and he brought a great deal of expertise and experience to the board and, and his wisdom. And Jay thought outside of the box. He did not uh, accept recommendations from exp other experts, if you will, uh, without him doing his due diligence and really researching the issues. And so I think Jay was a, an extremely good board member who did his homework, did, attended some conferences a, a fair bit and researched and read and did, did what I would hope all board members do. He took his job extremely seriously and did, I think he did a great job at it. So I, I would, I would qualify Jay as an expert in my humble opinion. I'm just one. And I think we need more people like Jay on there who have the interest of the participants of the plan 
truly at heart and making sure to, to represent McCarthy's point earlier about making sure that the plan is here today. <clears throat> um, I, you know, I hope so. I, I, you know, the board members, all of them, they're doing the best. And, and uh, you know, it's, you, that's why you want staggered terms. So that you have expertise constantly on the board. I think that's a good, good idea and worthy of consideration. And I think that, you know, support that conversation and notion. But I also know that it's important to have stakeholders in the form of teachers on the board making decisions about the teacher system, I think. It's borne out in the past experience with Jay, for example. Recollect anybody making a political decision not in the, and, and in some way, I think what you're asking, Representative Hooper, is that in some way that was in opposition to the best interests of the board. I've never seen that or heard that. And that to Mike and Steve, if they have the option to. So we have a lot more to get into. So let's hold up, hold that question and we can certainly come back to that. Um, Sam Lefebvre. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I thank everyone for being here to testify today. I just have a um, an overall statement, I, not particularly to anybody, um, but as I've said before, and I will say again, um, we have an opportunity that could put the responsibility ultimately to the stakeholder, and that would be a divine contribution plan um, that gets rid of that gets rid of a lot. Um, it, it puts it right into the hands of everyone, and that is something um, we have not had the opportunity to look at of how that would look. No comparisons or even just a hybrid. Um, I would appreciate that. Um, and if someone did feel comfortable having control of their plan, there are annuities available. Um, but that would that would get rid of people having to own up and pay for mistakes that were made on our end. Their money would be working for themselves. Um, so I would I would just appreciate just if there's any feedback upon that. Um, but to me, that would be putting the responsibility right with the stakeholder themselves. Thanks, Sam. Um, so we are continuing our conversation about the governance, uh, proposed governance changes. And um, I'd like to move now to Pat Gable to share any perspectives um, from the judiciary on the proposed governance changes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I would just like to know, I really appreciate being invited uh, to comment because this is the first time that the judiciary has been invited to comment or participate in anything related to uh, the pension plan proposal, even though everyone who is a permanent or limited service employee in the judiciary um, is in some way or other uh, impacted by these uh, governance decisions. So as Steve Howard said, I will leave to our testimony on plan design uh, comments related to that. And I'll just have a couple of quick comments about governance. Uh, unlike the other speakers this morning, uh, uh, we in the judiciary can't speak from experience regarding the governance of the plan because nobody from the judiciary to my knowledge has ever uh, participated um, in any of the governing bodies. Now, I might be mistaken about that in history, but um, uh, we don't have institutional knowledge about that. Um, I do, however, um, have some uh, knowledge about uh, board governance generally and the kinds of best practices that lead to good performance on boards. And so some of the themes that have already been mentioned today, I think are important ones. Uh, one is expertise. Uh, the plans already have employees who have skin in the game. In other words, decisions made about the plans impact uh, not only the state's contributions, but their contributions as well. And uh, some of the ideas you floated for new plan designs have that sharing concept to go even further. So it's even much more important than ever that the right expertise is represented on a governing board when you're looking at uh, trying to make sure that you maximize investment returns and you do it in a way that reflects, uh, to use a good word that was used earlier, wisdom. Um, and so it isn't just that you're a technical expert, but that you also have the wisdom of looking over a long period of time about how markets work, 
uh, what diversity in the portfolio means for a big plan like this, which is a different approach from what you might take as an individual investing. Uh, and so for, on behalf of uh, the beneficiaries who work in the judiciary, we want their pension uh, benefits to be secure and to provide them the retirement that they expected when they accepted a position with us, uh, understanding what the benefits were that were offered. Uh, the, the second point I'd make is that it is very important to um, have the appropriate diversity on any governance board. And so as many people uh, who participated on different kinds of boards before know, one of the ways you do that is develop a matrix where you're not only looking for expertise, expertise is sort of like a given, you must have the expertise, but at the same time, how, how do you ensure that the diversity of uh, the population, the diversity of uh, beneficiaries is represented? And there's many different kinds of diversity uh, the diversity can be, you know, ethnic, racial, gender, age. There's all kinds of diversity. Uh, and what you would hope is with a good process, a recruitment process, a selection process, a turning over the rocks process to make sure that you're not just going to the usual suspect or the people you know, but rather that you're really asking, where can we find this diversity? and without giving up anything in terms of the expertise. And so I've, I've heard some comments about looking at boards in terms of political or not political or looking at board management and labor. And when I, I have read the materials um, that lead up to your um, pension proposal in terms of all the different factors that played into bringing us where we are today, and I think they're very complex. I think that no one thing that you do is, is gonna be the magic bullet, but I would hope that uh, the governance that's ultimately adopted demonstrates best practices, both in terms of reliable investment returns, but also best practices that um, make sure that different ways of looking th at things are brought to the table and that there's not a lot of group think. Uh, and also that all those cognitive biases that all human beings have, we all make cognitive errors. Uh, we know that the, some of the obvious ones you know, lead to issues of racism and sexism, but they also go to confirmation mm -hmm. bias, which is we tend to believe things that already match what we you know, believed before. That, that, that kind of diversity I think does help break that up. So um, the Vermont Judiciary, uh, we're a, you know, a separate and independent equal branch of government with the legislature, and we make it a point of not taking policy decisions about things that are really well within the legislature's bailiwick, but we do take positions um, when the decisions are impacting judicial administration. And judicial administration does include uh, making sure that we have the best workforce we can to deliver the rule of law to all Vermonters and people who come to our courts and to manage our branch uh, in a way that's responsible to the taxpayers. And so in that regard, I would just support um, all the different kinds of best, best practices uh, that that show effective boards, uh, including getting good investment returns, but really having a broader view. Tanya Vyhovsky. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for your testimony and for your service to Vermont. Um, I am wondering, as you speak of best practices, and I know there's a lot of different ideas out there, if there are specific places that you would point to that we should look for those best practices. Uh, and you mean going beyond just the investment uh, yes. practices, but also yeah, the good construction board. of the board. And yeah, yes, there, there's a, there are actually quite a lot of resources on that. So they're not at the tip of my fingers, but I'm happy to identify them and share them in materials uh, for the committee. Uh, there's, there's been a lot of work done on uh, board 
governance. And uh, I'd be happy to provide those. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Peter Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I, I'm trying to uh, draw on your unique experience uh, from the judicial point of view on um, what wisdom could be translated over into the subject of the day, namely governance. And, and let me, uh, may seem a little odd, ask about juries and their size. I, I think it's fair to say that the jump uh, to 16 member governance board is different, i uh, put it that way. Um, uh, is there a reason juries generally are from five to nine rather than from 15 to 17 or 19? Thank you. So um, historically our juries come uh, from the common law, which started in England a, a number of centuries ago. So to some extent, um, it's the wisdom of the ages, I think, that brings that to. But in Vermont, um, in uh, criminal cases, we have 12 person juries. And it's an open question uh, as to whether um, fewer juries than that in the civil uh, docket um, without the consent of the parties can be permitted. And so um, uh, we could talk a lot more about that. But I would say you did raise an issue that I believe uh, in, in the context of this investment responsibility board, I should mention uh, a larger board um, is not gonna bring you better investment returns. And so one of the challenges I think will be that you need to keep the board in a manageable size and yet find these diversities. And so um, there's you know too small a board, you don't have enough representation and challenge to group think in different points of view, too large a board becomes very difficult uh, to make uh, good decisions. And so I don't think, I wouldn't um, presume to know, uh, given public pensions, that's not my expertise. I wouldn't presume to know what the best board side is, but I would guess that it's probably smaller than uh, what you've presently um, got on the table. And I, can I mention one more thing I did mean to mention? Fiduciary is a really, really important word. And I've served in innumerable nonprofit boards over decades. And one of the things I noticed on boards, even when they otherwise have quite a bit of good representation, particularly in smaller communities or in the context of a community of practice where people know each other well, is that it's easy to forget our fiduciary responsibilities. The fiduciary really needs to know what the mission and goal is of the board. The board has a responsibility to put the goal and the people who they represent above their own. And often what can happen when you have um, people on the boards who are also representative of constituencies is very well-meaning, totally well-intentioned, but forgetting that, forgetting that even as you do come from a particular constituency, that you have to find a way to put those aside and make decisions that are gonna be best for the um, security, longevity, and return on investment for the boards. And I think that comes with accountability, transparency, and continuous education and training. Even board members who've served on a million boards would really benefit from group training on a regular basis. It's a way to revisit um, uh, principles. You, you, know, you sort of get lost in the problem solving and you have to step back and take a look at principles. And often the healthiest boards engage in training on a regular basis often bringing somebody in from the outside, not to tell them what to do about the plan in this case, but to remind them of you know, what their goals are, uh, how is performance measured, you know, what, what are the factors? You know, the fact that you had a good investment year, well, that's great, but what's your historic track record? Um, so I would really encourage that um, whatever outcome takes place in terms of governance, that again, that healthy, um, respect 
for the fiduciary um, responsibility of a board member is front and center at all times. Thank you so much. That's, uh, that's good wisdom to share. Um, and uh, I thank you for that. Uh, so we have two more perspectives that I would like to hear from this morning um, in our first round on the governance question. And uh, so I'd like to go to Mike O'Neill of the Vermont Troopers Association. Um, Mike, thanks for being here. Please share your thoughts with us. Good morning, Madam Chair. Thank you for having me here. Um, committee members, I appreciate the opportunity to testify on these issues. Um, we haven't had the opportunity to, uh, I'll start, I'm sorry, my name is Mike O'Neill. I'm the director of the um, Chirpers Association for the record. These proposals, as everyone has commented on, have come out very quickly and we haven't had the opportunity to get feedback from our membership yet. So the feedback I've gotten, especially on the governance piece of this has been very limited. Yeah, as everybody would expect, the focus of our members when these proposals came out was on benefit structure and changes to benefit structure um, and has caused extreme anxiety and concern among our members, but I know today we're talking about governance. So I haven't gotten much feedback from them. The, the comments I've heard this morning from um, Patricia, Jeff, and Steve are some very good ones and some suggestions that I think are very important to consider. You know, when looking at the objectives laid out in these proposals, the objectives are easy to agree with. We, we all want a fund that is going to perform at a level better than we've seen. But I don't think in any of the testimony taken leading up to these proposals, we've gotten answers to what happened with the performance and why the fund underperformed. Yeah, it's easy for people to point at the members of VPIC and put the blame on them, but I'm not sure that's fair not knowing what the, you know, the cause of this was. Were actuarial assumptions incorrect? Was investment advice we were receiving um, you know, poor advice, should we have been going in different directions and making decisions? And if we're talking about governance, I'm not sure why we need to rush through this. If we're going to change the makeup of a board, uh, back to Steve's point, we have time to study this. Why couldn't we study over the summer the best practices of the boards around the country that have performed well and are a, a level above where we've been? You know, why would we rush into making governance changes? there should be a lot more time to discuss this, study this, and as somebody else said, investigate what took place. You know, why were we missing targets? And in missing those targets, I'd like to point out that the unfunded liability that we are facing, everyone agrees, is a real issue. You know, our members are as concerned about this as the legislature is or the treasurer's office or anybody else, but that unfunded liability is also an assumption based on actuarial work done by the same actuaries. Yeah, you know, other numbers we're talking about accurate, how do we have confidence in these numbers as well? It, everything we've seen from the actuaries, we've missed the assumptions on. And you know, if we're going to really look at how we turn this fund around, whether it's with governance or benefit structure, you know, we need to have confidence in the numbers we're talking about. Um, so I, I don't, I think, have any real suggestions yet on what we think should happen with the governance of the plan. One thing I would like to point out is the Troopers Association does not have representation on a retirement board. You know, we were members of the VSEA until 2009 and made a decision to leave and form our own union. Since that time, we've operated without representation because when we left VSEA, we left behind the ability to run for representing you know, run for a seat on the state employees board. So we would make the suggestion that if we're going to look at governance, one of the things we look at is the VTA having representation on the state employees retirement board. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a fairly simple request. We have, or at least I have as you know, the past president of the Troopers Association and now the director, always follow what goes on with retirement. We talk to the people on the boards. We're always talking to the treasurer's office. You know, there was a question of, have you had concerns over the missed um, investment targets? And the answer is, uh, of course, yes. And we've had conversations with the treasurer about this over the years. Um, 
But again, I don't have a good enough understanding of how VPIC has functioned to know why this has occurred. Um, another question I heard earlier is how will the benefit issues or the governance of the plan impact recruitment? Re recruitment is already an enormous problem for the Vermont State Police for various reasons. The profession in the last two years, as we all know, has really drawn enormous public attention. And we expect much more from police officers now. The um, public accountability, which we support, is much higher than it's ever been. It's become a much more difficult job. And the reason most police officers get into the job is the benefit structure that's involved. Yeah, I heard testimony last week about the difference in the benefit structure for the VTA and that of other state employees. And that's a policy decision, why there are different benefits, but it has a huge impact on our ability to recruit if benefit structures are going to be changed. It's one of the real issues that we will face when already um, in the middle of a recruitment crisis. So right now, I think our position is that this really should be slowed down when looking at governance. There should be a summer study and really look at best practices and how we get to the best possible position of governing our funds. Thank you for being with us, Mike. Um, and uh, I appreciate that, uh, that you've been asking a lot of tough questions about uh, how we got where we are um, and asking those questions of members of the retirement system boards as well as VPIC um, and, uh, and the treasurer's office is uh, uh, certainly a worthwhile endeavor um, because all of the decisions that are made uh, within the retirement system boards and the, the VPIC uh, are what contribute to the you know, the bill that gets handed over to the legislature. And our role in this has, no, has nothing to do with, you know, making any of the decisions um, that happen with the system boards and the VPIC. Uh, but we are left uh, needing to figure out how to, how to pay the bill in the end. Um, and, and continuing to pay the ADAC is an important uh, goal of ours. Uh, but also uh, it's, I think incumbent upon us to uh, to ask some tough questions here about how we can make that ADEC payment um, more uh, predictable and sustainable in the long run. So that's why we're here having this conversation. Um, we have one more uh, member of the retirement system to, to hear from today. And uh, just for members of the committee, um, our three retirement system boards um, are the teachers board, the state employees board, and our municipal employees uh, retirement system board. And uh, we don't have um, we don't have the level of concern with respect to the uh, health and vitality of the municipal system uh, as we do with the obvious uh, threats to our our teachers and state employee system. Um, but since they are a part of the same um, uh, uh, investment and governance uh, structure, uh, they, they are by default swept into this conversation about making changes to governance in order to uh, do a better job at, uh, at, at uh, meeting our, our investment return goals. And so we have with us Chris Duby, who is um, a member of the municipal system. He's a firefighter from Hartford and, uh, and the incoming chair of the FEMERS board. Is that right? That's correct. Thank you, well, Madam welcome. Chair. Welcome. Here's, and, uh, here's your first, uh, first chance at the job. So uh, thank yeah, you for being with us today. In house government ops, and I appreciate it. I spent a lot in Senate government ops through the years. Um, so yeah. So I'll start out by saying that, you know, from the VMR side of it, we, we hear the concerns, um, but we do have our own concerns with this. I'm speaking specifically to the retirement commission. Um, you know, first of all, the, the speed of this is, is concerning to us. I mean, it, things came together relatively quickly this week. I mean, I started getting emails bounced to me. Oh, I think it was Tuesday. Um, while I was on duty and, and getting bombarded with phone calls, you know, what's going on. Um, so our concern is, is, first of all, is the speed of this proposal. I agree with the other, the other individuals that have testified that 
to me, this, this isn't, it's an emergency, but it's not, this, I, I, let me equate it to like a freight train. You're sitting on the tracks, you see this train coming, you know this train is coming and now we're in the, this, like the 11th hour and it seems like this is being pushed down our throats. Um, I think that this is something that needs to have the brakes put on and looked at um, a little more thoroughly studied. Um, as far as the VPIC, I've spoken, my representative from Beamers, um, Kim Gleason sits on the, the VPIC board and I got her perspective on it. Um, as you know, our, our, the Beamer side of it is, is actually probably a little better. We're like in the upper 70s, if not close to 80% funded. Um, so there's a feeling that by, by pushing this new model down our throats that we're being asked to step up to address issues that the state has neglected to address. Um, that's not settling well with the members. I don't, I'm not saying that's your intention or your direction, but that perception is there. So we feel we're being forced to make a substantive change to, to the way we've done business to address a shortcoming with the other two retirement funds. Um, as I read through this, I'm, I, like I say, I'm with, with Trooper O'Neill on this. It, you know, I'm still digesting this as I go through it every day and learning and learning more. But when you look at the proposal, it says in the first line about the commission has proposed to oversee the investments and management. So what, in my eyes, I'm looking at it, the more I look at it, maybe I'm reading into it, I could almost be construed that as the management of how the, each board is run. Now that's a grave concern to us too, because now it feels like you're taking more authority away from each individual board as to how they're ultimately going to run their respective systems. Um, again, the individual board's authority is of concern to us. We want to make sure that we don't lose what say we currently have with VPIC. Um, speaking with um, Tom Galanka with VPIC and again with, with Kim Gleason, my representative, it seems to me like VPIC has, has made some drastic improvements over the years. They're getting back on track to where they should be. Um, I would concur with the other individuals that testified that to me, it's almost two separate issues. One being the years of short funding the account and trying to make up that shortcoming through rate of returns. Um, you know, I, I have a four, five, seven plan and I, I, I would like to think that every year I'm gonna make 12, 15% return. You may have that some years, you may not. The years you do, it's great. The reality is that over the long term, you're not gonna have 12% returns. So I, I think that the changes they've made at VPIC have, have improved their um, rate of assumptions. I'm not saying that there's not some work we could do to improve that. I think that studying committee, getting an outside source to look at it, maybe making recommendations on how to tweak it would be a much better way to go than to add members. Um, the other thing that, that struck me as a concern was that I wasn't aware that at one time the VPIC committee was actually made up of I don't know how much of the numbers, but 12, 14, 15 members. And it, it was a committee that met that said that, that was too many that's to bring it back down to a more manageable number. I will agree that the larger committee you have, the larger commission you have, the more members, it is a lot tougher to get consensus um, with anything. And I'm, I'm a, from my perspective on the board, I'd be concerned that that could be detrimental to the success of BPIC investments because you have so many different voices involved that you're never going to reach that. Um, and without looking at it, I mean, those, those are my biggest concerns is that A, that you're moving, this is moving way too fast. Um, it's a lot to digest in a very short time. Again, I'm still getting, still getting feedback from my other board members and, and so forth. I, my, my other concern is that, so like I said, that there's, I haven't even spoken with VLCT yet to get their perspective on it because they do have two, uh, two of my board members are from the employer side and, and VTC was, uh, VLCT was one of them. And I'd be curious as what their perspective is with um, your town managers and so forth, weighing in on the, this dramatic change to this policy. So, I mean, I, I guess at this point, I don't want to be redundant because there's been a lot of testimony and I don't want to repeat a lot of what has been said, but like I say, our concerns would be that our authority would be diminished, um, that you're trying to tweak a board that, that had a lot of changes, that is making changes in the right direction. Um, 
maybe the best avenue is to like, I agree, study, take time to study this, figure out what the root problems are and address those and make the changes as need be and move forward that way. I just think that this, this proposed retirement commission is such a drastic change and puts a lot of, you know, when I look at it, there's a lot of political appointees on it and so forth. It would be a concern to me that it's going to limit the, the employees say on it to a degree and it's going to be more heavily weighted on on the political administrative side of it, which obviously has a different path forward. Um, so I think of that, I'll open up any questions. Like, I apologize for not having too much prepared because this was kind of thrown the last minute and I was been on duty for the last 36 hours, so. Completely understandable. And, um, and I know that, uh, I know that that the VMERS board has been uh, more peripheral to the uh, the issues that really bring us here to the table today. Um, so committee, I would like to um, take a five minute break and then come back to hear from our next set of witnesses and, uh, and really wanna thank the folks from the various system boards and, um, and, and Pat and Mike who, who don't have a seat at the system boards um, for being here with us today and, uh, and continuing this conversation on how, uh, how we might restructure the governance of our pension system to uh, to really uh, try to see better, um, better returns and, and better accuracy of our predictions in the future. So thank you so much, committee. Go ahead and go off camera for five minutes and we'll be back um, at 10.06. Uh,